Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sean Casey, and I'm the director of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs at Georgetown University. Thank you for joining us for today's program, Christian Nationalism in the United States. Our panel features Andrew Whitehead and Samuel Perry, co-authors of the book, Taking America Back for God, Christian Nationalism in the United States. Before we get to our discussion, a few housekeeping notes. First of all, keep an eye out for more programs related to race and anti-racism in coming days. On July 1st, we'll have a panel entitled Listening to Black Clergy, and later in July, we'll have a panel called Listening to Black Scholars. You can sign up for our events on the Berkeley Center website so you can receive notices of upcoming events uh, for the rest of the year. We do record this uh, particular webinar and it will be sent to you if you RSVP'd and if not, it'll be posted on our website where you can find a recording in a few days. Um, in the last 15 to 20 minutes of our hour together, we will take questions from the audience. And if you would like to submit your question, please start doing that now. You will see a Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. You can type in your questions there and we ask that you please include your affiliation as well as your name. Let me now take a moment and introduce our, our two panelists. Uh, first of all, we have Andrew Whitehead. Uh, Andrew is Associate Professor of Sociology at IUPUI and there he's affiliated with the Center for the Study of Religion in American Culture. He's interested in how religion both shapes and is shaped by the surrounding culture and how this influences various social institutions, such as the family. His research has been featured across a number of national outlets, including the Washington Post, CNN Today, and the Huffington Post, among many others. He obviously is co-author of our book, Taking America Back for God, which provides the first comprehensive empirical analysis of Christian nationalism in the U.S. He is also the assistant director of the leading online data archive of the Association of Religion Data Archives, and he is associate editor for the journal Sociology of Religion. Joining Andrew is also Sam Perry, who joined the sociology department at Oklahoma University in 2015 after finishing his PhD at the University of Chicago. He's also affiliated with the religious studies and the women's and gender studies departments. His research explores the interplay of religion and cultural power, usually within the empirical, con empirical context of American politics, race, sexuality, and families. His work has been published in Social Forces, Social Problems, the Journal for the American Academy of Religion, and numerous other journals in the fields of sociology, religion, and sexuality. He has also published uh, a book called Growing God's Family and Addicted to Lust, He's currently working on a forthcoming book about how cultural ideologies get baked into English Bibles through the processes of translation and publication. So thank you, Sam. Thanks, Andrew, for, for joining us today. Um, let me begin by saying you've written a fabulous book. Uh, it, it's incredibly timely. It's stimulating. And uh, my text now has fewer un-underlined lines than it does a, a underlined lines. So I, I basically butchered your book because there's so many interesting notes uh, to, to be uh, made there. So let's begin by letting me ask the question. You, you start your book by saying you've got three major arguments that you're setting forth over the course of your text. Could you take a moment and run those three arguments for us? Yeah, for sure. I'd, I'd be happy to start with that. Um, again, to thank you so much for the opportunity for being able to talk about our book. We um, are obviously fascinated by this and so really excited about being able to talk with you and, and with others that are here with us today. So in our book, um, yeah, we make many arguments, but kind of three major ones. Uh, and the first is pretty simple, that we're trying to show that Christian nationalism matters. If you want to understand our social world, if you want to understand the political polarization, even the cultural polarization, a lot of the things that may trend on Twitter, all of that stuff, you have to be aware of and think about Christian nationalism, and especially politically. Um, and so this comes in a number of different ways. The book, um, and because the news cycle moves so quickly these days, um, the examples we give in the book seem old, but really we're just trying to show that with in any time period in the coming months even, 
um, what you see take place, if you understand the lens of Christian nationalism, you're going to be able to have a deeper understanding about what happened and not only what, but why. Um, and so with the recent protests, with the clearing of um, the square in Washington, D.C. and Trump walking over and standing with the Bible, when these things happen, Christian nationalism can help us understand that. And we're excited to you know, talk about that more today. Uh, the second thing that we're trying to, to make a case for in the book is that not only that Christian nationalism matters, but that it's also something um, that isn't reducible to other things like racism or authoritarian personality or social dominance, um, those types of things. And so a lot of times people will say, well, really, if we just get down to it, it's, it's that people are probably racist or that people just embrace authoritarian measures more than others. And we find over and over that even when we um, account for how authoritarian somebody might be, um, or if they have racist values or beliefs, Christian nationalism um, still tells us something new about how they see the world and why. And related to this, um, a lot of, I'm sure, people that are with us today, and, and you too, Sean, um, will read news stories and people will talk about evangelicals or white evangelicals and say, well, it's this group that, you know, came out for Trump or, or pushing this way or that way. And, and what we're trying to do is to show that um, that is a little bit too blunt of an explanation. Um, white evangelicals do uh, support President Trump, um, by and large, but it isn't necessarily because they're evangelical. Um, it's because we argue uh, of Christian nationalism. It's because they embrace this cultural framework, as we call it. Um, and that is the driving force. This ideology is what really causes them. Because 20% of, of white evangelicals didn't vote for Trump and um, aren't for him. And so we hope that this book will kind of show that you have to account for Christian nationalism. And that's a way to really understand what's going on. Um, and then the last point we make is, is somewhat related to that, that Christian nationalism isn't just religion writ large. Um, when we account for the level of somebody as they embrace Christian nationalism, we find that um, they're, how often they attend church uh, or read their Bible or pray, those types of actions can actually work at cross purposes with Christian nationalism. Um, so one example would be um, if we hold Christian nationalism constant, but somebody attends church more or attends church less, the one who attends church more might be much more um, readily available or they would, they would look at uh, police injustice towards African Americans as something that's real. But those that don't attend church or attend it less, they're much more likely to say, oh, police treat blacks the same as whites. And so again, Christian nationalism, as that increases, they, it makes um, Americans much less likely to say that, um, you know, police um, are, you know, use undue force towards African Americans. And so really the book is about Christian nationalism matters. It's not something else. It's not reducible to these other things or just a religious denomination. And then two, that it's something different from religion. Uh, which is important to, again, understand what people do and why. Um, and so those are our kind of three main arguments. And, and Sam, um, you know, he might have something to share off of those two. Yeah, I, th I think beneath all of those things, like a, unifying, a unifying kind of plea and angle that we have in the, in the, in the book is, is we, and one of the motivating factors in writing the book is that we, following the Trump election, we were, I think, both curious and kind of frustrated with the uh, the broad strokes that were used to describe this group of religious Americans who uh, were supporting Trump, voted for him, and still support him to this day, using broad strokes like white evangelicals or conservative Christians. And I think what we're trying to identify in the book is we would, we would love to push journalists and scholars to use greater precision in the language uh, when they're talking about this group. It's not necessarily being a white evangelical. Like we try to show that over and over again. It's it's not about being a white evangelical, believing you, believing uh, the, the Bible or, or going to church a lot. And matter of fact, as Andrew was just explaining, oftentimes it's the people who go to church. We find that once you account for Christian nationalism, they have, hold more pro-social values. They're, they're more uh, in favor of uh, progressive racial policies and uh, less uh, conservative in a lot of other ways. And so what we're trying to argue is that um, white evangelicals, uh, I'll just use them as, use them as an example, uh, there happens to be a high percentage of white evangelicals who are Christian nationalists or high, you know, affirm Christian nationalism. 
And that is what's driving them to pull for candidates like Trump or pull for certain policies, not their theological conservatism or their religious commitment per se, if that makes sense. Yeah, so I, I think you slayed sort of two sacred cows there, at least in, in my amateur ears, that on the one hand, there are people who say, you know, we saw a lot of polling who said, well, the real explanation here or is race, or the real explanation here is authoritarianism. And so certain pollsters went out and, and sampled for one issue and they said, well, clearly this explains everything. And you're saying it, it's really an ideological web here of a number of, of commitments. It's, it's more complex than we've been led to believe. And the other thing is, is on the, the, the attendance, you know, for years, this has been axiomatic that the more frequently you attend church, doesn't really matter what kind of church, the more right wing politically you're going to be. And again, your data suggests, no, that's, that's too simple, that it really was quite revealing where you said there's evidence to suggest that more frequently you attend, there may be a, a reaction against a national, uh, white national or Christian nationalism. So you really do bring a, a sophistication to this whole nexus of issues that it's more complicated than, than we've been led to believe by, by certain folks. Um, I'm curious then, it, it, fairly early in the book, you, you describe uh, four different American orientations towards uh, Christian nationalism. I'm wondering if you can take a moment and describe for us what those four categories are and, and, and tell us uh, their relative size and, and, and how did you come up with this particular typology? Right, this is, a, I'll jump in and Andrew can, uh, can, can follow up and fill in the gaps. Um, I, I love answering this question because this is the one I get asked so often, like either on Twitter, social media, or, or just in person. We tell somebody I'm writing a book on Christian nationalism. We explain how it behaves. And then the next question is, well, am I a Christian nationalist? How, how do I know? Uh, do I follow, you know, I'm, I, I go to church. I, I consider myself a committed Christian. Am I a Christian nationalist because I hold certain political kind of values? And, and so let me get to getting into the four orientations is really, uh, uh, beneath that is how we measure Christian nationalism at all. So the scale that we try to use and that we've been using in various surveys and we've been using the scale over and over again to the extent that we can collect survey data is uh, we, we have three, what we call our six level of agreement questions. And so it's, it's basically we, we, we give respondents uh, six statements to respond to and they're asked to indicate how much they agree or disagree with the following statements. Things like the federal government should declare the United States a Christian nation, or the federal government should advocate Christian values, or the success of the United States is part of God's plan. Uh, we ask one about uh, the federal government should enact a strict separation of church and state, and that's when we reverse code so that higher scores on that would suggest that you don't want separation of church and state, you actually like those two things working together. So six level of agreement statements, and what we do is we add those together and we create a Christian nationalism scale and it goes from zero to 24. So people who score a zero will be uh, the lowest. They, they say strongly disagree to every statement. Uh, the people who score 24 would theoretically say, I strongly agree with every statement or they strongly affirm the Christian nationalist kind of uh, statement. And so what we did with, uh, with the book in, in order, rather than just talk about whether somebody scores a 12 or somebody scores a 16 on the Christian nationalism scale, what we decided to do is we decided to break this up into four orientations to Christian nationalism on the basis of where people fall along this continuum. And so on the, on the far left, let's say, the, let's say it goes from zero to 24, on the far left you have people uh, that we would call rejectors of Christian nationalism. These are people who score like a zero to five on the Christian nationalism scale. So these would uh, be people who, when you ask them, the federal government should declare the United States a Christian nation, strongly disagree. Uh, the federal government should enact a strict separation of church and state, strongly agree. Uh, so they would affirm, uh, they, they would, uh, sorry, deny that uh, the United States has any kind of special relationship with Christianity that we should institutionalize in any kind of uh, way, strongly in favor of separation of church and state. Now, this group of people is about, in our survey that we use for the book, it's about uh, 22%, but you could say it's roughly a fifth, roughly a fifth of Americans uh, in 2017 and, and around that time fall into the rejector category. Uh, the next category over, these are people who score about a six to an 11 on, on the Christian nationalism scale it, are the resistors. So not as strongly as rejectors, uh, 
but they are still resistant. They still score below the average in terms of uh, their support for Christian nationalist ideology. So they resist the idea. They, these are about uh, a quarter of Americans, about 25, 26% uh, in our survey. And they, uh, these are uh, people, if, if we're looking for like a demographic profile uh, of these folks, these are people who go to church a little bit more than rejectors. Uh, they are uh, a little bit more uh, likely to be represented by Christian denominations, more likely to be mainliners, more likely to be people who kind of have a, have a, have a religious history of, of acknowledging separation of church and state and thinking that that's a good thing. So they still reject the idea of Christian nationalism, but not as dogmatically or not as fervently as rejectors. Then over across the threshold, so once you get past the average, once you get past the mean, you have this large group of Americans that we call accommodators. And these are people who are generally friendly towards Christian nationalism. They're not true believers. I'll get to those in a second, but the, the accommodators are, are almost a third of Americans. And so they're about, in our survey, in the book, they're 32% of Americans. And so these are churchgoers. Uh, these are uh, people who uh, read the Bible, believe the Bible, they pray frequently, and they would con most of them would consider themselves uh, Christians or believers in, in, uh, in, in some uh, Christian faith across the spectrum. Uh, and, and yet they have a, a, a little bit more of an appreciation for the separation of church and state than our last group, our true believers, right? Like they, they are uneasy. They would probably affirm that the United States, you know, prayer in public schools is probably a good thing. And, uh, and religious symbols on public spaces, yeah, I don't really have a problem with that. And Christian values, that's good. But they probably wouldn't strongly agree that the United States should, should declare itself a Christian nation or that we have some kind of special relationship with, with God where he has to, you know, we values the United States above all. This last group we call ambassadors of Christian nationalism. These are the, these are the true believers. And so I, I wouldn't necessarily say that these are Christian nationalists. Uh, I try not to use those. We try not to use those terms synonymously, like ambassadors are all Christian nationalists. But this would pretty much be the group that we're, we're talking about mostly. And so this is about a fifth uh, of Americans in our survey. And we've since fielded several different surveys, and it really does land at about this, about this number, about a fifth of Americans uh, being... Uh, ambassadors of Christian nationalism. So these would be the folks who, would, who took the survey and uh, down the ticket, they either agree or strongly agree that, you know, the federal government should really institutionalize this idea that the United States is a Christian nation, uh, that, that we have a special relationship with God, that separation of church and state, it's overrated. It's, you know, it's misunderstood as, as, a, as a kind of autodidact historian David Barton would say, you know, they, they would say separation of church and state really was about uh, the government not encroaching on, on the church's freedom, uh, but, but certainly uh, religion can uh, influence government as much as it, it wants to, and it should. And, and the United States should, even in Robert Jefferson's words, uh, preference, preference Christianity. It always has and should always, therefore. Uh, and so uh, this would be the four group of, of people, rejectors, resistors, accommodators, and ambassadors. Now, even though this is a, a heuristic device, like this is just kind of our, our little separation of this scale so that we could talk about it in terms that make sense uh, to people, you'd be astonished at how, how, uh, how much these four groups differ from one another. Oftentimes we uh, compare these four groups statistically and each one is different from the other. And I think that's indicative of how, uh, what Andrew was saying, Christian nationalism matters as an, as an ideology. Where you fall along the spectrum really does tell us so much about your views on everything from Trump to guns, uh, to same-sex relationships, to transgender issues, to race, uh, to immigration, to Muslims, uh, to atheists, to um, gender issues, all, all of those things. And so um, those are the four groups and that's kind of how I explain to people where they may fall along that, that continuum. Andrew, do you wanna follow up with any of that? No, I, I think that was great. Um, you know, just echoing Sam, you know, as we've measured um, Christian nationalism across different surveys, national surveys, and finding that this really holds true. Another part of the book that was interesting as well is looking over a decade, you know, shifts in the size of these groups. Um, and we find that those, the rejectors and resistors have grown just slightly um, over the last 10 years. And ambassadors have you know, shrunk just slightly from 10 years ago, but accommodators are about the same size. And so really over a decade, there's some small change, but it's relatively stable. And so as we look um, to November or we look, you know, 10 years from now, 
um, these groups are going to be there. And, and even if ambassadors are shrinking a little bit, um, something that Sam and I have, have written about and, and others too, is that um, the group, even if it gets a little bit smaller, that almost portends that Christian nationalism will be even more important because they'll see themselves as an embattled minority. And so this isn't going to go away, even if there are fewer people in the future that say they're ambassadors or at least agree with these things. Um, it's going to become even more influential to their identity and how they see the world and, and what they do. And so, um, yeah, the last point, too, is that knowing if somebody's a rejector or a resistor or an ambassador tells us a lot. So it isn't just whether somebody's a Christian nationalist, but we know a lot about somebody if they say, I reject that completely. And so, yeah, we find it's a useful heuristic to understanding where people are, how they vote or whatever else. So let me let me ask you uh... Two, three quick questions, and I'm wondering if you if you have a access to breaking down these four categories by gender, mm -hmm. and two, do you have any inkling of how they're distributed across the country? Mm -hmm. And I'll hold my third question. And, but but if, I'm, I'm curious if you have any guesses or you have any data to, to answer those first two. And yeah. Then, yeah, I can I can take that first. Um, so one really fascinating part um, in the book, and it's the uh, Four Americans chapter where we kind of look at these four groups. Um, we do find that Christian nationalism, these four groups are spread um, across the country. Now in the South, you're going to have more accommodators, more ambassadors, but you have a lot of rejectors and resistors. And in the West, you might have some more rejectors and resistors, but you still have a lot of ambassadors and uh, accommodators. And so um, that was really instructive to us that again, we aren't, we can't just say that it's all Southerners or Northeasterners or, you know, speaking of gender, if we look at these groups, rejectors um, and resistors, um, it's pretty even across the board compared to accommodators and ambassadors. We find that um, there are slightly more women that are ambassadors than men, but it's, it's very close to a 50-50 split. And so here again, it isn't just gender or, or region of the country, but um, you know, men and women in these social groups that interact with this cultural framework um, tend to hold it or reject it in either way. And, and Sam, I don't know if you have thoughts too that come to mind. Yeah, I mean, I think um, one of the things that we're just now exploring, and Sean, you didn't you didn't mention this, but I think it's implicit in the in the idea is how this maybe shakes out by racial group as 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 well. Um, <laughs> And this, I think, kind of plays into the irony that, that Andrew was, was talking about, that, that women often tend to score higher on this Christian nationalism scale than others. African Americans actually score pretty high on Christian nationalism on, and, and on the various surveys that we've given. But one of the things that we're just now starting to explore a bit more, and we don't touch on this enough in the, in the book, frankly, I think we were a little bit, a, a little bit kind of focused on the political implications and, and, uh, and didn't have all the data that we have now as we've been able to collect subsequent data uh, since we finished the book, is um, among African Americans, Christian nationalism just behaves differently than it does uh, for white Americans. Um, most of most of what we're looking at in the book, um, we're looking at in a general population, and we're controlling for race. But one of the things that happens when we, what's called, we do an interaction with race, and we see how race interacts with our Christian nationalist ideology. Is, is we find that for white Americans, especially Christian nationalism banks them hard in a far right conservative direction on almost every issue. Uh, and yet uh, for African Americans, uh, holding what we call Christian nationalist ideology, even though it, it works differently for them, uh, seems to make them inclined more towards seeing the United States as what it could be, uh, envisioning the, the ideals of what America was supposed to be, uh, a land of justice and opportunity and equality. And so Christian nationalist ideology means something different for white Americans, or like our survey, our scale, uh, when African American respondents are, are filling that out, or white respondents are filling that out, they have a different conception in mind, clearly, on, on, on what it means to declare the United States a Christian nation or to advocate Christian values or that we'd have a special relationship with God as a nation. Uh, for African Americans, we see that that means like we, we need to be the kind of country that uh, in, in institutionalizes equality and that provides liberty and justice for all. Whereas for white Americans, Christian nationalism serves more as a as an indicator that they're using the term Christian as a racial dog whistle. And so like I, I think uh, as I've tried to explain this for people, like I think we have 
in political discourse, we have dog whistle politics, po uh, uh, words that uh, reference a particular ethnic group covertly. Uh, and I would say Christian, for a Christian nationalist, for a white Christian nationalist, for those ambassadors and accommodators, uh, the word Christian comes pretty close to being a racial or an ethnic dog whistle. It, it means people who look like me uh, value the things that I value uh, and have my same kind of native and racial or ethnic background. And that means something different than, say, if um, a Latino or a, an African American is is affirming the same kinds of theological things. That's very helpful. Uh, let, me, let me ask you my third question, and then we'll, we'll move on. I, I'm intrigued as a consumer of uh, the work of sociologists of religion over the last three decades, that as you described this, this is a heuristic device that you think has analytical power and it helps explain these forces. I, I'm just curious, you know, you think back to uh, the, the resorting of American denominationalism that was first really seen in the 80s and 90s, that it was no longer left to right between denominations, but often within denominations, and, and people sort of bought that sorting as, as a real thing. Uh, then we had the rise of the unaffiliated and the nuns. Um, so I'm just curious, looking at your sort of white nationalism uh, uh, index and spectrum here, you've come up with a new taxonomy, if you will, that, that you think has more explanatory power. I'm just curious, and this is very much an insider baseball question, how do your sister and brother sociologists religion react to this? Now, obviously your book is just out. It doesn't, hasn't had a long shelf life, but I'm just curious, in your professional interactions, uh, do, do your people in your own discipline look at this and, and agree that really this may be an interesting framework that has legs and endures and, and actually if you have comparative data, will, will shed more analytical light. I'm just curious how that off the record kind of conversation is going as you travel the country and, and interact with more of your fellow sociologists. Yeah, I, I can take a stab and then I'll be interested in Sam's thoughts too. Um, you know, the, the reception and kind of the discussion that we've generated over a number of peer-reviewed articles and then this book has been um, positive and, and interesting. So I think, you know, one thing that we try to make clear in the book and that I think our colleagues would be sure to, to call us on is that um, we, you can't use Christian nationalism to explain everything. It's not like the originating factor that now you don't need anything else and this is it. Um, and so that, you know, is a point well taken. And we try to say that in the book that it is closely related to, um, you know, as we show in the book, you know, if you, the different religious traditions you're a part of, um, when we put those in the model with Christian nationalism, they no longer are significant. So it doesn't matter if you're an evangelical or a mainline, what really matters is your level of, of Christian nationalism. However, you know, Christian nationalism is much more prevalent in evangelical denominations or, or uh, congregations. And so it isn't as though we're saying, you know, evangelicalism just doesn't matter. Um, what we're trying to say is that in these groups, this cultural framework is prevalent. And so that is that factor that's really pushing it. And so I think the point I'm trying to make too here is that um, it isn't as though it's now explaining everything, but it's a very important factor that we've overlooked. It isn't just private religiosity measures but the degree to which people want to see Christianity and, you know, Christian in the public sphere, that is something altogether different. And I think that's a really fascinating part of this work and, and our colleagues work is that um, we need to understand how Americans think of religion interacting in, in the public sphere as well, not just in their private lives. Yeah, I, I would have, I would uh, affirm what Andrew said. I think we're we want to avoid monocausal explanations for all the things that we're we're looking at. We want to be we want to acknowledge all the other things that have predictive power when we're trying to understand political attitudes and and voting behavior and all those things. Um, mm -hmm. And yet, at the same time, I hope at this point the power of this as an analytic tool is 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 undeniable. I mean, I, I think in in study after study, I, hopefully we have demonstrated beyond the shadow of a doubt that this matters and it matters on its own in many ways. Uh, not that it's independent, but it matters as its own separate thing, as we're trying to argue in the book. Um, I think there have been, I think, and fruitfully, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative of this. I think there have been different terms for also what we're, what we're trying to do. We call it Christian nationalism. That's what we first uh, identified it as, and I think that's a pretty good word for it in the United States. Uh, but if you expand it out to what's going on uh, across the globe, uh, so we, we, we definitely see the rise of populism in, in other 
nations. I think Rogers Brubaker, a sociologist at UCLA, uh, kind of he refers to this in the European context as, a, as an identitarian Christianism, mm -hmm. uh, really a, a Christianity as culture. I think um, other scholars, political scientists have called this ethno traditionalism. Uh, I know. Uh, 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 Jack Delahanty and Evan Stewart and Penny Edgel have, have referred to this as public religious expression. And so I, I think all similar terms for the, the kinds of phenomenon that we're describing. And so I think Christian nationalism and white Christian nationalism especially is proving to be a powerful analytic tool in conversation with all of these other things that we already knew matter. Well, I think that's very helpful. I think if you, you look at the study of global populism, you see also this expansion of vocabulary. And it, it, it's a really exciting time, I think, that people are trying to conceptualize. But at some point, uh, it would be interesting to sort of sort and, and try to see how these uh, different uh, labels and, and formations actually overlap and reinforce or, or actually disassociate with each other. I mean, we're looking at, at a possible global comparative populism study and uh, the, the literature from political science to sociology to religion is just this amazing complex train wreck, um, right. <laughs> um, which is good. I mean, this is how yeah, we, yeah. we make progress. And I, I, I agree with you. I think your, your analytical or synthetic uh, construction here is really going to be quite helpful and it, it defeats some stereotypes that journalists, politicians, and all kinds of uh, professional people take for granted. And, and so I, that's one of the reasons I, I love your book is it, it pushes us to think uh, more creatively and, and really to rely on some very interesting uh, data. So let's move to our, our, our third uh, section here before we get to the Q&A. And I want to talk about the, the 2020 presidential election. Uh, I will face unrelenting grief from my staff and colleagues if we don't get it a few minutes in on this. So let me, uh, I have a thousand questions here. And obviously, I'm not going to be able to run all of them. Uh, pretend you're campaign uh, advisors. And again, I'm not asking you for who, who you support, but I'm curious what would your analysis be to the Trump campaign here in, in June uh, 2020 about where this set of react these four reactions to uh, Christian nationalism? What are the implications of your analytical lens for the Trump campaign? In other words, can they can they run the same campaign, win narrowly in the electoral college by getting a high, uh, uh, sorry, similar or larger? Uh, uh, voting block from Christian nationalists, or if they lose any, is that going to be uh, really harmful or even devastating? And on the second, on the other hand, what advice would you give Joe Biden's campaign? Would you tell him ignore religion? Uh, if there are persuadables out there, where do we find them? Are they among the accommodators? I mean, who, who, who would you tell uh, the Biden campaign to look for? So I'm just curious if you'll uh, spend a few minutes offering free off the cuff uh, advice to both campaigns. <laughs> yeah, um, well, I'll take a stab first and then pass it to Sam. Um, so I think as we look at the Trump campaign, you know, one, one larger um, thing to keep in mind is that Christian nationalism, and at least this iteration of kind of the last 40, 45 years that we're really looking at in our book, mattered before Trump and will matter after him. So even in the fall, it's going to matter, but it's not going to go away. Um, and I think as we look at the decisions that they made leading up to 2016, and even as he's been in office, um, you know, even going back to what's now, I guess, a couple weeks ago when he stood in front of the church with the Bible in his hand, um, they need to and, and are, you know, working to continue to lock down that group of people that supported him overwhelmingly in 2016, and they need them to continue to do so in, in 2020. Um, and so he is, you know, trying to show, you know, I hear you, um, I see you, and I'm going to continue to use, you know, this office to um, support the vision that you have for the United States. Um, and he is willing to do that for them, and they are willing to continue to support him to have that done. And so as we look at kind of the, the more famous ambassadors like Robert Jeffress or Franklin Graham, you know, when Trump cleared the square and stood there with the Bible, they were excited. They liked it. Um, you know, and news stories I read of, um, you know, people in you know, Georgia, you know, as they watched it happen, they saw, they, you know, exclaimed, he's making a Jericho walk, you know, this kind of idea. He's, he's walking for us and he's defending our vision of the United States for us. And so I think for him, they'll continue to do that. And I think they would have to, because again, as you pointed out, it was a narrow electoral college win 
you know, 80,000 votes spread across three different states, if that switches, things are very different. And so he's not trying to reach rejectors or resistors. Um, he is trying to focus on those. And so I think on the flip side for Biden, um, you know, accommodators and resistors make up a vast majority of Americans. And they're the ones that are in the middle that they aren't, you know, overwhelmingly in favor of this idea of a Christian nation um, with resistors. They, a lot of them still see a positive aspect of religion, at least playing a role in public life. And so I think those Americans, um, you know, could be spoken to and shown, you know, we're stronger if there's a strong religious freedom, like a, a real, that term's kind of been co-opted too, but where every religious group can come and, and be a part of a civil society. And accommodators for the most part say, yeah, Christianity is great. Um, they, they like it, but it's not at the detriment to other religious traditions or religion necessarily. And so I think those people could be talked about for just kind of a stronger, um, you know, whether it's a civil religion or at least freedom of religion in the U.S. where um, we're all apart and moving towards a, a democracy that, that works for everyone and not privileging one uh, for the most part. So I don't, Sam, what do you think? Yeah, I would I would affirm all of that. I think uh, I I think Trump um, has got the ambassadors locked down because I think they're going to be on Team Trump no matter what. Like Andrew was saying, they they saw the they saw the the, the Bible move in front of the church as, as the greatest thing ever, and uh, he could have done anything, and it, it would have just been sticking up for the faith, and that's how they interpreted that. I think ambassadors were probably the ones, uh, especially amb fringe ambassadors towards the average. Uh, we're probably more likely to say, yeah, that was pretty, that was pretty indulgent, you know, like, and, and, uh, and, and reaching a, a, a little bit. Um, and yet at the same time, the ambassadors uh, are also probably really tempted to, when push comes to shove, pull the lever for Republicans in, in November, just because of things like abortion or because of partisan identification or because of maybe fears of religious freedom. And so that comes to Biden. So uh, I think just like what Andrew was talking about, I think the worst thing Biden can do would be to write off, uh, I think, sincere, uh, but sincere, but frustrated uh, conservative Christians who are probably in the middle of that Christian nationalism scale, maybe uh, kind of the fringe ambassador or fringe accommodators. Um, I think some of the, one of the things that Barack Obama did so well, and I think Hillary did a poor job of, is... Um, is, is not allowing oneself to get sucked into being framed as a culture war combatant. Uh, I think Barack Obama, I think, deftly uh, tried to avoid those kinds of labels. Uh, he, even though, I mean, I think by, by ambassador kinds of people, he would have been pinned as a leftist and a communist and a Muslim and somebody who was out to restrict religious freedom and take your guns away and those kinds of things. But I think uh, more so than previous candidates, Barack Obama tried to portray himself as a, as a as a friend uh, to, to, to people who are uh, religious and people of faith as well. I don't think Hillary Clinton did that well. I think she just kind of allowed herself to say like, yeah, you people are marginal and I'm not, I'm not going, you're, you're a basket of deplorables and, uh, and uh, I, I don't regard you as worth the time of, of, of wooing. I think Biden needs to, to come out strong as, as, a, as, a, as a person who would, if, if I were trying to, to, to play on this kind of the importance of Christian nationalism. I think he would, he would want to avoid uh, the extreme anti-religious or secularist kind of, uh, which is not Biden anyways. Biden is a religious man. He has a, comes from a Catholic tradition. And he himself has said, say on the abortion issue, that he is, he is, he is not somebody who would personally advocate abortion, but, but somebody who appreciates uh, a woman's right to choose and is not going to overturn Roe v. Wade. And I think that allows him to kind of uh, to try to tone down the or to remove some of the ammunition that I think the really, really aggressive kind of Christian nationalist front would want to throw against him and say, look, this is a rat. Biden's a radical leftist. Uh, he is anti-religious freedom and he's coming after you. And, and I think if he can avoid that and not give them momentum, I think that would be the best thing Biden could do. Make himself be a friend of faith-loving uh, people. One, yeah. of the, one of the statistics you, you cite, which really caught my eye, is that 60% of independents are resistors or rejectors, mm -hmm. uh, which was really quite interesting to me. Um, 
Well, let me let me ask you one follow-up question. One of the revelations that's supposedly in, in the uh, John Bolton book, and we'll see whether it proves to be true or not, is that allegedly the President of the United States told President Xi of China, go ahead and build your concentration camps for the Uyghurs. That's the right thing for you to do. And on, on the face of it, from in terms of international religious freedom, that's absolutely appalling to have the President of the United States essentially uh, endorsing what could be categorized legally as genocide. We don't have the data to, to answer that definitively. Yeah. But could there be a shocking moment of that scale where a, a number of uh, either accommodators or, or uh, ambassadors could, could absolutely be horrified and think that they've been plagued by this administration with that all the religious freedom rhetoric is actually a ruse? Or, or are they just so... Uh, firmly in that ambassador role that even that could make a dent in their numbers. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on this one if that's okay, Andrew. So uh, I don't think it'll move them a bit. Like I think uh, I think they would probably more likely to be moved by the loss uh, uh, this past week at the Supreme Court or the, the two losses. Like you've got these conservative justices not not doing what they're supposed to do for 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 the team and Trump coming after him. I mean, he went after him on Twitter today and just saying like, hey, this is a, this is a lost cause. And he, he, he tweeted out today, hey, uh, you know, we, we need to get more Supreme Court justices because the rest are going to take away your Second Amendment. Vote Trump in 2020. I mean, that's, re, that's what he tweeted. Right. So uh, I don't think the, the whole religious freedom angle in, in China, I don't think it'll bother them one bit. And I think that really actually gets down to what religious freedom means right. for white Christian nationalists. They mean it like uh, uh, people in Massachusetts Bay Colony meant religious freedom. It, it does not mean religious freedom to believe whatever you want or to do or to or to believe something contrary to us it means our religious freedom to do what we want right. uh, and that's exactly uh, i think so i mean whether some other country is is doing that um you know hey we need to worry about our own yeah. country and kind of defend our right to to, to maintain power and control yeah right. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. Ambassadors um, will will view any sort of religious freedom just like that. I think accommodators, and especially in this moment, as we take into account what's happening, um, and I'm not an expert on this, and don't want to portray myself as, but with Black Lives Matter and really how public opinion is shifting um, in this moment, um, I think accommodators. There could be moments where something happens that it does. I don't know if it'll cause them to you know vote. Uh, Biden, but um, a colleague of our, Ruth Bronstein, wrote a really great paper in response to the 2016 election outcome where every presidential election comes down to essentially who can make a really good case for a narrative of who we are. And that's what people are choosing. And so in 2016, Hillary uh, Clinton and the Democratic Party didn't make a very convincing narrative, or there were a number of them that people didn't unify behind. For Trump, it was just very clear. There was one narrative. And, and they could unify behind that. So I think coming up or, or with these types of questions of, of religious freedom elsewhere, um, I think resistors and, and accommodators as well, um, if there's a strong narrative of, of what's going on and why this is an issue, similar to what's happening as people protest um, police injustice, um, they, it might start to um, work, work in them. And I don't know if it'll push it all the way, but, but things are shifting and moving and, and something like that could possibly happen. But um, they would need to be made clear and that narrative would have to be clear to show them what it means and why, I think. So one last question before we go to Q&A. If you believe the current polls, the president is experiencing a pretty significant erosion apparently among white Catholics and white evangelicals. And this is pure supposition that I'm asking you to engage in. Where across your spectrum of these four responses, where do you think that erosion is taking place and is it related to the failure, say, of the president's narrative in the face of all the trauma? I'm, I'm just curious if you have suggestions there. Yeah, that's a good question. So I, I recently collected, uh, so my colleague, uh, a co-author and I, Joshua Grubbs, who recently collected some panel data. So we're following the same group of Americans over time and have been since August. And we fielded a survey in, in February, mid-February of 2020. And then we just fielded one in mid-May uh, of this past year. And we asked Christian nationalists the same, we, we asked them the same question to identify on our scale of Christian nationalism. And we also asked, who do you plan to vote for in 2020? And so with that, we could compare, and I tweeted this out the other day. I saw it. With, with that, we could compare, okay, are they changing? Are Christian nationalists changing? And it turns out there's, they're basically exactly the same. I mean, almost the, the, the numbers lay on top of each other, almost. I mean, very, very slight differences. 
My, my guess, though, uh, if, 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 say, white Catholics are declining in their support for Trump and you see a little bit of erosion, my, my guess would be it would be polarizing. So, like, it's, uh, in, the, in, in other words, the middle, in terms of, like, the accommodators and the resistors are clearing out, and people who were formerly resistors of Christian nationalism are moving more into uh, uh, team rejector and, and, and uh, even more likely to say, uh, no way, no how, not going to go for Trump. Uh, but to the extent that it crosses over, I mean, I think, I think ambassadors are a lock regardless because it's just desperation. Um, so I think what you're going to see is you're going to see movement in the middle, hopefully, and, and people, uh, moving more towards, um, people in the middle moving more towards an extreme. Yeah, that's very helpful. Sure. Well, thank you, Liz. We've got a lot of questions in line here and I've, I've spoken too much. So let me, let me jump right in. And, and so we'll start. Yeah. Uh, this is a question from Michelle Borstein, who's uh, one of the religion reporters uh, for the Washington Post. She says, do you find non-white Christians who embrace Christian nationalism, uh, how does this impact their views of the places of non-Christians in America? Can we be a pluralistic country if non-white Christians also agree that the country should be explicitly itself Christian? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think, you know, there's some data that Sam and I have been analyzing um, even this spring where mm -hmm. looking at, again, whites um, who embrace Christian nationalism versus um, non-whites who embrace it and how it works differently. And as we look at uh, immigration or religious freedom questions or how other religious groups should be treated, we do see that there is a difference there. Um, and so I think um, for for non-whites who embrace Christian nationalism, they tend to um, be less um, interested in, in making it only about uh, Christianity or privileging Christianity in the public sphere. Um, and so I think, you know, to some extent that, that is true. Um, but we do find then, you know, as we look at other issues like um, issues of the family or gender, um, there aren't many differences um, between white people who embrace Christian nationalism and, and non-whites who embrace Christian nationalism. They tend to look very similar. So again, there's kind of these interesting differences playing out as we look at different religious groups or, or racial groups and how Christian nationalism operates within those. Um, so Sam, I don't know if you have, have thoughts too on that. Yeah, I think in that, in that analysis that Andrew is talking about, this isn't necessarily in the book, but something that we're following up on. Um, I think some key metaphors is, 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 is America God's melting pot or is it God's mosaic? Okay, and so, so white Christian nationalists would say that, that America is God's melting pot to where like everybody should be the same and like us and they don't appreciate diversity. Uh, but African Americans and Latinos who affirm Christian nationalism uh, on similar measures are more likely to, to say that no pluralism is a good thing. Like uh, they value the place of immigration, they value the place of minorities and the, and the, their role in society. And so I, I do think, uh, uh, minority individuals, people of color uh, uh, are more likely to, to the extent that they affirm that like, hey, uh, America has this Christian identity, they're more likely to affirm what that at its core uh, would ideally be, right? Like a land of like tolerance and acceptance and, and, um, and you know, kindness to one's neighbor. Okay, we have a question from Aristotle Papa Nicolaou from Fordham University. Telly says, in Greece and Italy, it's very common to encounter atheists who yet identify as Orthodox Christian or Roman Catholic. Mm. Does a similar phenomenon exist within Christian nationalists, I assume, in the United States? Right. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll take this one, Andrew. Uh, so uh, I think Rogers Brube Brubaker has identified a similar trend just across Europe that uh, Christian nationalism, or what he calls Christianism, uh, has, has very little to do with very little to do with piety and devoutness, and it's more of, of Christianity as an identity to say we are natives, we are we're the people who belong here, and this is our culture, uh, and we're going to defend it. I, th I think it's becoming like that in the United States more so. Like I think it's kind of getting the Christian identity. I think in some ways is getting hollowed out by Christian nationalism. I mean, to to the extent that we're People question whether white evangelical is really even a religious category anymore at all. Is it, is it more of an ethno-political uh, category? And there's debates either way, but I think um, one, of the, one of the reasons we don't see that in the United States is because we have such a strong evangelical tradition and such a strong evangelical language. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and so people like Robert Jeffers or Tony Perkins or Franklin Graham, who I, who I would consider to be ambassadors of Christian nationalism, um, they can very fluently speak the language of Christian devotion, right? Like it's a, it's a, it's a conversionist, uh, biblicist kind of Christian language that talks about uh, faithfulness in language that I think sincere Christians would, would affirm and appreciate. Um, and, and yet, when you look at kind of the values that they would trumpet or support or the way that they, the logic that they use to think through political decisions and the kinds of policies that they want to advocate for, I think it would suggest that, no, they're more interested in cultural and political power and influence, right? And so um, all, that, all that to say, in the United States, we don't see this kind of phenomenon of atheists or secular people affirming Christian nationalism like we would in a European context. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if... Um, I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if in the future, as I think uh, Christianity kind of gets hollowed out by this political phenomenon, uh, we would see more people saying, yeah, Christian nation in the, in the sense that it just means conservatives uh, and um, people like me. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think you, you did find a significant number of ambassadors for whom like attendance and membership in a particular gathered Christian community seem to be more of a notional thing rather than a practice. Am I, am I remembering that correctly or am I wrong? Yeah, we find ambassadors of the four groups, they tend to be the most religious by and large, but there are ambassadors who are nominally religious and some that, that aren't really. Um, have a personal piety, but overwhelmingly they are religious. Um, and a colleague of ours too, Ruth Bronstein, she has done work where um, she finds that this idea of a Christian nation and Christian nationalism can be a point um, of creating links between people who are personally religiously pious and those that aren't. Um, and so it kind of gets to what Sam was talking about is happening in Europe. Um, it doesn't happen to a large scale here, but the, the kind of framework and the groundwork is there uh, in the future for sure. Okay, we have a question from Patricia Thomas who says, thanks for your comments. A couple of questions. Number one, how many people did you survey, population size, and how were respondents selected, random, self-selected, et cetera? Yeah, so the, the data for the book, we, we build primarily off of two data sources. Uh, the General Social Survey, which is fielded out of um, a, a group up at New York, uh, Chicago, University of Chicago and has been since the 70s. And it's kind of the gold standard um, of social science surveys. And so generally with each wave, and it happens every other year, Sam, that's usually like 3,000, 4,000 people. Um, and they do, it's a nationally, it's a random selection of the American population. Um, the other data source um, is the Baylor Religion Survey, and it's a national random survey. Um, people aren't self-selecting in. Um, and in the waves that we looked at, there's 1,600, 1,500 people in each wave. And so for both of those, those are, um, you know, amounts that allow us to do some good statistical analyses on and, and are right in line with um, the types of sampling you would get um, across any, you know, trustworthy survey. And in, and in all the papers that we've, we've published or written so far, it's used either those data or nationally representative data like, data like the Chapman University Survey of American Fears or recent uh, quantitative data that uh, we fielded. And also in the book, we use interviews or so we draw on in interviews with men and women from around the country. And, and that was more through uh, networks that wasn't a random selection of folks. That was a, what we'd call a purposive sample that we, we tried to get a, a number of people across our Christian nationalism spectrum. So once we had enough rejectors, we moved on to like ambassadors and accommodators and resistors. And so we wanted to make sure we had a good diversity of people, both men and women around the country who affirmed different kind of values, Christian nationalism on, on our Christian nationalism measure. Okay, we have a question from Spencer Real. Are there any plans for a detailed micro survey of how these dynamics play out in a single religious, religious community? Do all the congregants of a church tend to be part of one of these four categories? Do, they, do people segregate themselves according to these beliefs? So uh, uh, Lydia Bean, as, uh, she's a, a sociologist and now candidate running for office in Texas, uh, uh, she recently uh, wrote a book on, uh, let's see, I have the book right here, uh, uh, The Politics of Evangelical Identity. So 
Lydia's work. Uh, so Lydia actually uh, makes an argument about this uh, in her book. And what she does is she, she interviews and, and spends a lot of time gathering qualitative data uh, from evangelical Christians in Canada and in the United States. And she identifies Christian nationalism within in those groups. And she would argue that it's really a kind of a combination of both self-selection, people s select into these congregations that will affirm similar values. But there's also through various kinds of religious strategies, you're able to communicate like, hey, this is the kind of politics that we appreciate around here. And if, and if you don't, you probably either keep it to yourself or, uh, or you kind of get on board with the kinds of values that we hold. And so it becomes pretty clear within Christian congregations where you, I mean, you know, everybody on social media, you have ca casual conversations. It's pretty easy to see where everybody stands on most political issues. And so people either select out of that or they kind of get with the program. And so we have not done a, a micro analysis of a congregation. I think Lydia did a great job, but I, I think there's lots more room to do. And so if this young scholar would like to, would like to spearhead that, I would, I would, uh, I would heavily endorse such a, such a thing. Well, I, this is funny. I know Spencer, he was a Clemson student. And so Spencer, this is, we, this is what we try to do with the book. We lay it out and now <laughs> it, it creates questions that, that smart scholars can go and, and run with. But yeah, Lydia's book is great. And um, there's other research that's happening where people are looking at how these things are trans, how this transmission happens, whether it's in communities or generationally. And so I'm, I'm really excited to see a lot of that work start to come out. We have a question from Kenneth France, who claims to be from the University of Oklahoma. So we're just going to take him on his word here. Uh, uh, elsewhere, you both have compared Christian nationalism to fascism. Would you mind talking about what the two ideologies have in common? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll take this one from, from Kenneth, whom I know. So um, I'll take, uh, so uh, one, of the, one of the works that I think has influenced my thinking uh, a lot on this is by a, a philosopher at Yale named Jason Stanley, and he wrote a book called How Fascism Works. Uh, and I think it was especially enlightening for a variety of reasons. It's a, it's a really good book and I'd recommend it. Um, but I think one of the reasons it, it, it has become so impactful is because I read it after we had published a number of studies uh -huh. on Christian nationalism. And as I looked at him go down his chapters and describe what fascist politics looks like. And, and I, don't, I, don't, I don't wanna use the words like you're a fascist, like that doesn't help, that shuts down conversation. Calling somebody a fascist or saying you're a fascist is, is not as helpful as saying, hey, this is, this is an example of fascist politics. And I think what he does is he, he, he goes down the list and says, these are characteristic of fascist politics. And I think our Christian nationalism research has affirmed that they sure do, if, if Christian nationalism walks like a duck and talks like a duck. And so it, it, it sure does behave like fascism in a lot of, a lot of ways. And so uh, examples of that would be uh, fascist politics seems to gravitate towards electing strongmen politicians. Uh, it seems to gravitate towards uh, limiting, uh, limiting freedom of speech and freedom of expression to the extent that it criticizes the nation. And so not big on, on uh, uh, not saluting the flag or not standing for the, the national anthem or uh, it, it, it has no appreciation for diversity. It has no appreciation for diversity in, in the sense of, of ethnic diversity or, or, or that kind of thing. And you could go down the list. I mean, there's just kind of all, all kinds of things. And so um, what I've tried to suggest, and I think Andrew and I wrote an op-ed on this recently, is I wouldn't say Christian nationalism, I wouldn't even say ambassadors are fascist or they represent kind of an example of like full-blown fascism. But what I fear is, is that it, it lays the foundation for a fascist style of politics. And I think it, it gravitates in that way. So I, I call it a form of like a, a proto-fascist ideology. It's, it's fascism on the way. And I, I hesitate using that because I, I fear shutting down conversations. Nobody wants to get called a fascist and it sounds kind of extreme. And yet when you read Jason Stanley's book and you read our book, uh, you're gonna see so much overlap that I don't, I, don't, I don't know how you can not kind of make those two connections. Andrew, do you wanna follow up? Yeah, I think, and in our interviews, what was kind of stood out to me, not only in the quantitative data and studies as they kind of line up with a lot of what Jason lays out in his book, um, but as we talk to people that were ambassadors, um, they're, you know, to the extent that they, you know, they believe that the Christian God has a plan for the United States, and this should be the plan that gets carried out. And when God is saying this is how it should be, for them, anything that stands in the way of that 
should not be given any quarter at all. Um, and there were people that would say, um, you know, we've, to the extent that anybody tries to push against how we think the U.S. should look, they should just be taken care of or getting rid of or not have a say in politics at all. So an understanding of pluralism or even a democracy, um, those are in direct contradiction for them. Um, people shouldn't have a say if they aren't going to get in line with how the U.S. society should work. And so as Sam pointed out, and in our you know interview data, we see again those that rings true to this kind of proto-fascism where it isn't about us working together and compromising. It's about one vision and who can deliver that vision. So we have hit the hour. Uh, Sam, Andrew, thank you. Great discussion. Yeah. Fabulous book, Taking America Back for God, Christian Nationalism in the United States. Uh, we will have you back after the election to look at the tea leaves and uh, see what worked and what puzzled us. But Ian, thank you so much, and thanks, everybody, for, for joining us.